many of us are more timid than she is in a harder context. And we would pray, Lord, that you would just embolden us all, fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, and uh, with the joy of the Lord would be our strength, and that there would be fruit, much fruit, fruit that remains flourishing, as you told us to do in Genesis 1, and the Great Commission going forth, and you being, getting all the honor and the glory. Let's do your name. We do pray for Chinese people who are uh, open-hearted and... Uh, <coughs> good faith that you would reveal yourself to them, draw many to yourself, and uh, we, we would see a, a strong, vibrant vibrant uh, church in glory when we are there, hopefully soon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we know uh, with, to, uh, with you to uh, live as Christ and to die as gain. Yeah. So we look forward to whatever you have for us, and this evening we pray you would be honored as we get into your work together. In Jesus' strong name, amen. amen. Well, thanks all who came out. Thanks, Trent, for leaving us in worship. Thanks, Heidi, for joining in on that, on the improv. Wow, that was one of the nicest improvs I've heard in a, a long time. Uh, very sweet. Well, um, I was thinking about a message that I preached um, a while back where I talked about five E words that characterize the church and how we have different ones that are favorites for us. Uh, and... Sometimes we reduce each one to things that they are actually broader than what you would expect. And those five words were uh, exaltation, evangelism, education, edification, and empathy. And uh, I'm not really preaching on them tonight, but I just kind of thought about how the, the Lord orchestrated <coughs> all five of those components for us tonight. I just thought I would kind of let you know where I thought I saw them happening before they even happened or as they're happening, okay? So the first is exaltation. We worshiped God in song. Thank you, Trent, for leading us, Heidi. Um, but that's that's part of, that's the core of everything. It's our highest goal in life, really, is to love God because he first loved us and to exalt him and to enjoy him forever and to make him known. Uh, the second is evangelism. Some people think of the church as an evangelism center, but hearing about world evangelization through uh, spontaneous cross-cultural evangelist uh, gives us something to pray for and to believe God for uh, new steps of faith obedience in our own lives the new president of Purdue University is from where China way cool a lot probably the largest percentage of international students at Purdue are from China so right here in our, our mission field here as well so uh, Evangelism. Now I want to talk to you about education. I'm going to take a little sidestep from the camera to grab something. <laughs> so here's a little bit of education. This is a guy, uh, Dr. James Tour. He's a graduate from Purdue University. He has a PhD from Purdue. He's teaching now at Rice University in Texas. He's going to be here at Purdue uh, the first uh, Saturday in uh, February, which is just about four and a half weeks away. Um, and we're really excited about it. He's actually a very close friend of Del Brosma from um, Upper Room Fellowship and Fred Moss from Upper Room. Some of you know these names. Um, he studied under a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. He's listed as among the top 50 uh, scientists in the world today. He's a very strong Christian. He's from a Jewish background, it's Messianic. Married a woman from a Muslim background, I believe from Afghanistan. So they have their own story of that, of reconciliation and coming under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, which is evangelism again. Uh, but he's going to be speaking on why would a scientist believe in God. Part of what he talks about is uh, there's a lot of belief that science has created life in a test tube or through uh, lab-like conditions. And he says not only is that not accurate, um, because he's a chemist, you, you cannot get from the periodic table to the simplest cell of life. But the more we discover and the more we unearth it, he loves discovery. He's a scientist. He's got more published articles than anyone we've ever had at any symposium at Purdue. And by the way, we don't have to say to the, the academic you know, uh, society there, oh, uh, James Tour is coming uh, and, and he's going to share about Jesus and they're upset. No. The 
chemistry department is going to have a special reception for him. He's that well respected in the academic community. But he will tell you, you cannot, not only are we not getting closer to creating life, but we're getting farther away because the more we discover, the more we discover that we don't know. That's a big God that we serve. So he will be there on February 4th. He's going to speak to a faculty gathering on the 3rd, and he's going to speak at Upper Room Fellowship on the 5th. But if you'd like some posters to put up at your uh, the place where you shop or at your uh, laundromat if you go to, I've, I've given some to Trent here from the coffee house, just uh, grab some here before you leave and take help us get the word out. Um, the question is, is there going to be a charge? Because it's mainly for the university, but it's also for the town, uh, for uh, Lafayette, West Lafayette, and it is free. But you'd like to think, well, well that's just because, you know, gold coins fall out of the sky. Actually, no, it costs money to fly him here from Texas and to put him up in a, a room, take care of him and his wife's needs and so forth. But our church, just FYI, has contributed. It's one of the contributing churches. You can see our little logo down here at the bottom of the flyer and some other sponsoring organizations. Uh, Rasio Christie being one of the prime movers on it, but up a room, of course, and uh, crew, uh, WDA, the launch, campus house and others so be in prayer about it come it is free so just oh i didn't mention some of the others so that's education well what about edification well i'm hoping there'll be some edification now because we're getting into the scriptures together so turn in your bibles it's going to be kind of hard to thumb through and find it but how about the first page the first book genesis <laughs> and uh, so we're in chapter one I just wanted to say a little bit in the area of empathy, uh, empathetic, empath, empath, okay, sorry. <laughs> emphatic ministry, there it is, yeah. So we have the ministry of Behold Recovery, we have uh, uh, all kinds of things going on for, we're, we're doing the, the coats and the gloves, uh, we made an announcement this morning to help out for people that are going to be cold this winter without these supplies, and of course Jackson Morgan's uh, involved with the, the Behold Recovery. But even tonight, I'm sensing that some of you may be here because you are drawn because it's a new start. It's a new beginning. Genesis means beginnings. And actually, um, here this end of the second week of January, you're probably embarking on some new beginnings yourself. Some of you have graduated from one thing to the next. Some of you have started a new discipleship curriculum. Some of you have started a new book in the Bible studies you're going through in a home fellowship. Some of you have started a new semester at uh, high school or at uh, college or at uh, uh, community college. Some of you have got some new goals that you've come up with at the start of the new year, which is kind of a tradition to have New Year's resolutions. And I think it's great to start in the Old Testament, let least re read of the Old Testament, and um, start going through the Bible from the beginning. And that's what we're going to do tonight. Um, so thanks for coming. Thanks for being part of it. Um, it means a lot to me to have you here. Uh, one of the things about this whole business of beginnings is that there is a beginner, and we know who that is. Yahweh, the triune God of the Bible, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And no matter how old you think the earth is, or how old you think the universe is, or how old you think uh, you are, <laughs> there's always something that comes before, except that the universe did have a beginning. <laughs> and but the incredible thing about it, no matter what large number you come with, up with, or small number, infinity exists before that time, and infinity will exist after that time, and God is in infinity. He is so huge, and it makes the time span, whatever number, concrete number you give it, look extremely small compared to the bigness and the grandeur of God. And that's important to remember when we look at beginnings. One of the passages of scripture that uh, we're going to cross-reference to, and you might thumb over there in case you're kind of uh, not, not a Bible quizzer, is uh, Isaiah chapter 46. And just, just put a finger in there. We're going to look at that in just a little bit. But it talks about our great God that not only is the beginner, but he knows things before they get here, which is also very interesting. So... One of the things that we, I actually uh, looked at some of the Hebrew of this first verse, 
and I do not do Hebrew, so this is scary time when you hear Joe Witcher saying some Hebrew. So um, I believe the very first word of the Hebrew Bible is barashit, and it means in the beginning. <laughs> and uh, it begins with a beth, is the first letter of barashit, and there are people that look at these letters of the Hebrew alphabet and say they are pictorial. I'm not smart enough to know what the deal is on that, but Beth apparently is a combination, and I've seen this, of the letter Resh on a platform that looks like a house. In fact, Bet means house in Hebrew. By the way, if you don't know the Hebrew alphabet and you'd like to follow along with that, you can put your other finger in Psalm 119 because it's an acrostic poem, and each section begins with a different uh, Hebrew letter in that, that prose of Psalm 119. But uh, there's a guy on YouTube, I can't even remember his name, but he talks about that uh, the uh, Resh is the son. And it's uh, the son that inherits the house. <laughs> and he comes out of the house, <coughs> and in the word Barashit, uh, the son comes out, and uh, so you got Beth uh, in the first uh, letters of the, the bar. The first letter and then bara is the Hebrew word for create. So barashit is a compound word that starts with bara, which means create. So barashit, bara, in the beginning, Elohim, God, plural of majesty, triune God, uh, created the heavens, uh, I think it's shayim or hashayim, and the eretz, which is the Hebrew word for earth. But they say that this, uh, the pictogram of that very first word, Barashit, is that the sun comes out of his house uh, to creatively deal with the uh, shin. Um, it's a letter that looks like a W in Hebrew, which is uh, represents fire and judgment. And the next letter is Yod, which is a smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet, which is a symbol of the hand of Yahweh. And you know what the Bible talks about, the arm of the Lord? And uh, Isaiah 53 talks about the arm is very, to whom does the arm of the Lord re reveal? And he grows up like a tender plant. The vulnerability, God in his smallness and his weakness is, is more powerful than the universe. To deal with the fiery judgment in his own hand in the last letter of Barashit, uh, Tav is symbolized by, in the ancient Hebrew, by a cross. In modern Hebrew, it looks more like a, upside down you with square edges. So it's, it's kind of interesting that they theorize that the plan of salvation is in the first word, <laughs> that the Son of God comes out to creatively deal with the wrath of God in his own hand at the cross. Um, but Barashit is an interesting uh, word because it also shows up, and that's where we're gonna flip to um, Isaiah uh, chapter 46, verse 10, to get another attribute of God before his, in addition to his infinity, existing um, infinitely before his creation and infinitely after his creation. 46, verse 10. Now we can start with uh, maybe verse 6. Remember this. This is God speaking and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Uh, remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no other. Get that? That's one of the first of the Ten Commandments there. Uh, there, there is only one God, and there is no other. So if you have other gods, things that are more important to you than God, those are called idols. And those are things we're not supposed to make or follow after. And that's the second commandment. But anyway, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things that are not done. So he declares from ancient times, from the beginning, uh, the end. So you've maybe heard people in business talking about begin with the end in view, <laughs> know where you're going. And the, the children's story, uh, Alice in Wonderland, I think she goes there, the Cheshire Cat says, uh, I, actually I think it's Alice says to the Cheshire Cat, can you tell me the way to go? And <laughs> the cat says, it depends on where you're going. And Alice says, oh it really doesn't matter. And the Cheshire Cat responds with, well, then it doesn't matter which way you go. If it doesn't matter where you're going, you can go any way you want. But the trick is God, of course, has declared the way 
from the beginning because he knows everything from the first to the start because he is in infinity and he has all knowledge. It's way surpassing what we have. And there's no other God like that. There's no other piece of religious literature that has the kinds of prophecies we see in it that are in the Bible and Genesis. Perhaps that word Barashit actually does hint at those kinds of things. But let me tell you something else, and this is from the science community. I believe I heard this first from Erica Carlson, that there's a four-letter word that's a nonsense word. It's mest. Not mist like Sierra Mist, the soda, but mest. And they use it as kind of an acrostic to remember the four parts of the universe. <laughs> so if you want to summarize the four parts of the universe into four different categories, here they are using the word mest as an acrostic. There is matter, there is energy, there is space, and there is time. Matter, energy, space, time. That's mest. And apparently, in science, especially in physics, this is commonly used as four categories to consider the totality of the universe. So, if the universe has a beginning and has a beginner, then the beginner cannot be matter. Because <laughs> matter doesn't create itself. Um, so, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Must be a different kind of energy that we have, an energy that doesn't run out. God is omnipotent. He has all power. Uh, uh, it can't be part of time because time is how long it takes the earth to travel around the, the sun, right? One, one, one lap around the sun, that's one year. You just got another year older because you traveled through time, uh, through space, and that's how we calculate our time. Uh, but God is outside of time because he's not traveling. He is everywhere present. Uh, and so matter, energy, uh, space. <laughs> He's spaceless. He cannot be confined to space. But if you have matter, you have to put it somewhere, so you have to put it in space. So our universe is matter, energy, and space and time, but God transcends that. Get what I'm saying here? This is why the part, one of the reasons why the Bible says God is holy. It means other. He is, you, you can't make a picture of him. He, it just blows your mind. He's so huge and big, and yet he's a God of love and grace. So we have <clears throat> matter and energy and space and time. When we start in Genesis 1, just read the first verse with me. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Just stop right there. You got your mist right there. In the beginning, time. God created energy, the heavens, space, and earth. Matter. Now, that may not surprise you too much, but as a non-science student myself, hearing that mess is a way of describing the stuff of the universe, it kind of strikes me that the Bible knows about some of the foundations of science before modern science and outlines it here in this first verse. Another thing, not only does he know the beginning from the end, but he also knows the composition of what it is that he's actually creating. And I think James Tour is probably right that this whole business of creating life, we are just not on top of that thing yet. So, moving right along, um, I want to talk about the next verse here. Oh my, I'm, I realize I'm using a small print Bible. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So. The Spirit of God, what an expression. We have Elohim in verse one, plural of majesty, they say, because ancient kings would talk about themselves. They say, we are going to do this, or we are going to acquire property. They own all the property, they own all the goods. So that when they say we, they're speaking for the whole country. So it's just kind of their, their royal way of talking about themselves. But when you know that the Bible teaches that God is a trinity, that God has had eternal love from eternity past. He wasn't lonely. He didn't create us to have a relationship. He had a perfect love relationship, the Father with the Son, the Son with the Spirit, the Spirit with the Father, the Son with the Spirit. Uh, God is love. And um, that he's <laughs> perfectly complete in himself. He's created as an act of grace, and he recreates through salvation, through Jesus Christ as an act of grace as well. But the Holy Spirit of God is the active agent of his creation in terms of this hovering over the water. It uses the term, the Spirit of God. 
and I just think that that's, that's fascinating to me, that he is hovering over the water. And that reminds me of a passage of Scripture. And some of you may be familiar with it, but it's in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26. And Ephesians 5, you'll probably recall, it's exhortations to husbands and wives about how to relate to each other in a way that um, is honoring to God and edifying to each spouse. And one of the things it says in the passage concerning uh, the husband's role is that he is supposed to love his wife and, um, and sanctify her, set her apart in a, in a holy position and wash her with the water of the word, the water of the scriptures. And uh, just as Christ washes his bride, the church, by the water, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. That draws us to faith in Christ. And here we have the spirit involved with the water right from the beginning of creation. And I think that's awesome. And it speaks of uh, God's design and inspiration of the scripture right from the very second verse of the Bible. So this book <laughs> that we are starting with new beginnings, and you can probably tell we're not going to get very far tonight, but uh, it's got a lot of powerful stuff right out of the starting gate for us for considering the direction that we're going to take in the new year. I want to take a look at verses uh, 3 through 5. To you here and God said let there be light and there was light this passage has kind of annoyed me from some time because I've always thought uh, oh so there was no light before God created light well actually there was light before God created light because the Bible not only says that God is love but also says that God is light and Jesus is the light of the world and we are light bearers because we are created in the image of God, so we reflect his light as we reflect his love and mercy and grace to a broken and fallen world as people who are sinners who have been bought by Christ's blood and commissioned to worship and to learn and to fellowship and to be involved in people's healing and restoration and education and salvation through sharing with the plan of salvation and exalting in God before it. So when it talks about God said, let there be light, this is created light that has a material source. <laughs> and you might say, well, what's the material source? I do not know what the material source is because the sun and the moon and the stars have not been created yet. But God created light, and that, you know, our science cannot figure out. Is light, uh, is it a wave? Or is it a, a particle? Or is it a wave particle? And, and we don't know. And so I'm okay with saying I don't know if science doesn't know what light is either. But I know this, God created, created light. <laughs> but God is light from eternity past to eternity future and always has been light, and always will be light. And I think it's interesting that the New Testament uses this language in John 1 when it talks about the Word of God, the Lagos of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We get that Trinity concept here again. Going, uh, The same was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And in Him was light, and the light was the life of every man, every human being. We have this light called reasoning, the ability to think. The ability to say, this guy's talking too fast. Or the ability to say, I need to write that down because I want to share that with somebody. Um, and to think about things and to chronicle it and to want to share it and unpack it in a different creative context. And that's part of what it means to have the light of reasoning. Um, that's one of the reasons why I like the name of the ministry I'm involved with besides Harvest Chapel uh, called Ratio Christi. It means the reason of Christ. The Bible tells us that we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we find that in our culture, a lot of people are eager to be in the empathy category of feeling and feeling love and empathizing with people who are broken and hurting and wanting to serve in that kind of capacity. And, um, but that, that's the heart. But a lot of times people say, well, don't think about it. 
don't think about it. But God wants us to love him with our mind as well. And there are good reasons to believe that God exists, that the Bible is true, that Jesus is the only way, that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. But people who just hear us say, well, just believe it or just trust it or just feel it, and they're not feeling it, they don't get it. So we're supposed to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, which gives us a full-time job. Uh, <laughs> but it's not really a job. It's kind of a joy, really, that we get to walk and live in and have a new beginning in, in the restoration, even tonight, as we, as we go forward. But the Spirit of God is brooding over the water, and um, we see that God uh, creates light. And God called the, the night day, and the darkness he called night, and there was an evening and a morning and a first day. So God puts a time stamp on his creation. We'll talk about that in some subsequent weeks. The next verse says, And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. And it separated the waters from the waters, just as uh, God said in verse 3, Let there be light. So this expression, and God said, as his creative word, we believe is the logos of God. Jesus Christ was involved in creation. He was before all creation. Some people say, because they're quoting Colossians, that he was the firstborn of creation, meaning that he was the first thing created, but he wasn't. Firstborn refers to divine privilege of inheritance. He's going to inherit it all. It's all his to inherit. Why do I say that? Well, in the Bible... Isaac was considered the firstborn, even though we know that Hagar was the first one born chronologically, but not the one who would inherit. And there are other examples of this in the New Testament where firstborns are actually set aside because it's the secondborn that actually has the faith in the promises. And that makes me a little bit nervous because I'm a firstborn and I can. My wife's a firstborn too. In fact, in some ways, everyone in our family is a firstborn. We have two kids. We refer to our son as our firstborn son, and our daughter is our, of course, firstborn daughter. By the way, I heard there's an ancient Chinese thing for this. Heidi, you probably know it. it um, that when you put the Ch ancient Chinese character for boy together with the ancient Chinese for character for good, it makes a whole new word. And that word is, you know what? It's good. It's good. And that actually harkens back to Genesis chapter 2. We'll get there next week uh, where God says, it's not good for the man to be alone. He makes a woman, brings him together. Now it's very good. It's very good. And this is, there are other things like this that are hints and windows in different cultures of God's fingerprint on us from the beginning, but we walk away from it and we distort the word of God to our, our, our failings. And that's not good. So anyway, I do believe that the light that's created here in Genesis 1 is a contingent light. And by contingent, I mean it's dependent upon God, because God created it. Just as Colossians says, he not only created the universe, but he holds it together by the word of his power. And he's holding us together. Sometimes you might feel like you're getting undone. Sometimes you feel like you need a new beginning, but guess what? His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. And he is holding us together for his purposes to bring about uh, glorification, edification, education, transformation, empathy, all kinds of discover your spiritual gifts, unleash them in the body of Christ, use them in the world where you serve. Um, very exciting times that we live in, um, and yet at the same time um, also strategic. So God said, and that reminds us of the Logos. Now I want to skip down to verse 26, and we will backfill on a future future day but verse 26 is the sixth day and this is where God creates human beings let's see 26 yeah then God said let us make man in our image and in our likeness that's how it translates in English uh, and it's using the uh, is that a pronoun, plural pronoun? Our and us, let us, let our. So they say again, this is the plurality of majesty. When kings do things as individuals, they're really doing it for the whole nation, so they're speaking in the plural. But we know that there is only one God, but one God in three persons. It's hinted at in this chapter all over the place. And uh, so God is creating a community because God is community self-contained and self-sufficient and eternal from eternity past in a love relationship 
uh, but he wants to create human beings and does so on the sixth day. In verse 6, let us <clears throat> make man in our image and likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. By the way, this verse is a poem, which is cool. When God's doing creativity, he does a little lyrical songwriting. And uh, that's pretty exciting. Moses, of course, writes it down, but under inspiration of God. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Three times created, people being created. I believe that we're a trichotomy, not a dichotomy. People, some people believe we're body and soul. That's cool. I'm glad they got the soul in there. In the science community like Purdue, a lot of times people just believe we're a body. So if they take a psychology class, it's really a class about how the brain functions. Or if they take an economics class, it's more about how to use capital, not about why to use capital, or why it's morally responsible to use capital or in a, a dignifying way. Um, it's the science of this. It's the science of that. And the science has declared that we have to keep God out of the picture. But God is the one who creates it, and so it impoverishes our, ed impoverishes our education to leave him out of the educational process. And God, from the beginning, intended that he would be involved in it and that we would be recipients of his knowledge and wisdom. I have a friend that wrote a song called American Meditation. It's not very nice about America. It says um, uh, basically that we're under God's judgment and we need to repent as a nation. Now in case you think it's just a political thing that he unpacked last week, he wrote it back in the 1980s. Uh, I think he wrote it before Reagan came to power. One of the things that uh, the lyrics says goes like this. What does God owe me? Did I ever give life to him? Did I make him see? Did I pour my knowledge through him? He said, no, you and I have never put God in our debt. <coughs> Only made him cry when our grand ideals were upset. So he sees that we have these grand ideals that we've replaced for God, whatever that ideal is, saving the planet, um, economic prosperity, uh, family first before God, <laughs> uh, whatever it is, um, that we put up ahead of God, and it, it, it mourns him, it grieves the Holy Spirit. It, uh, it make, it's not according to his creative intents, that he would be the one receiving all the glory. And uh, so humans are created in his image, and I believe I said a trichotomy, that we are body, soul, and spirit. The spirit, the way I understand it, is the place where the Holy Spirit of God dwells when a person becomes a Christian. It doesn't dwell in your your cells or in your in your bones and I guess metaphorically the, the word of God is like a fire in our bones but where does the Holy Spirit dwell when we become born again well people will say well in your soul what's your soul and usually they'll say well that's your mind physical brain usually is all they to reduce it uh, your will your volition and your emotions well the way I understand it is um, it's kind of hard for God to dwell in an emotion so I believe he has created a spirit within us and that spirit is dead and dormant and we like to act like it doesn't exist. But when we come under conviction by the Holy Spirit of God that he is true and we need forgiveness of sins, then that, that, that spirit becomes like a vacuum and it wants to be filled. And instead of filling it with junk that doesn't work, <coughs> God the Holy Spirit takes up residence there when we submit our lives to his kingship and lordship. And yeah, I got that from Watchman Nee know where he's from but anyway uh but uh, spiritual man but the whole thing is ah we're three-part being to have a relationship with the three-part being uh father son and holy spirit i just think these things are amazing they give me evidence of the inspiration of scripture and how it holds together and uh, and fits together so man was also given dominion but it's a contingent dominion 
In other words, yeah, we're smarter than the birds and the fish, yes, even the dolphins, and, and we have dominion over the cattle, and so we're gonna see specific roles that humans have in naming animals in chapter two after their habitats, realizing that they too are contingent within their immediate created environment, but they're also created <coughs> beings under God's authority, holding them together as well, and the way we manage it, and the way we treat them, and the way we respect God's creation in life, will be held accountable to the author of life and creation, God himself. And so when we talk about man having dominion, it's not a dominionating, dominating, uh, go in and brutalize, <laughs> it's, it's a nurturing, caring, want that plant to grow. I was just talking to Kim about uh, something the other day, I had three W words. <clears throat> I get frustrated uh, because a lot of uh, the ministry I'm involved in, probably like the ministry you're involved in with your families and other things, is preparing the soil for the seed of the Word of God, right? And preparing the soil is no fun. You're breaking up fallow ground and there's nothing happening. It's just a lot of back-breaking labor. And what are you preparing the soil for? To put some seed in it. Now you put the seed in it, now what do you do? Hardest part of all, weed, wait, and hope God waters. <laughs> weed, wait, and water. And the hardest part for me is the waiting. And you wait and wait and wait, and there's no shoot, find the <coughs> shoot. And you got a weed. And not, if you're like me, you might weed the wrong thing and pull out the fruit. And that, not good. So you got some know how in these things. And I do not have, I have a black thumb. It's the thumb of death. But unfortunately, I know people that have gifts in this. I know you do, Bill, and, and other people as well that are able to do this kind of ministry. And I can call upon their expertise to find out how not to kill my stuff. So when I grew up, we had a garden. And the only stuff in the garden that did well was stuff, well, actually the tomatoes are an exception to this. My father loved tomatoes. So the tomato plants were given extra care. But everything else, melons, um, zucchini, anything that sits on the surface that might sit in the water and rot, did poorly, very poorly. And uh, the stuff that did well was the stuff that was underground <laughs> because we couldn't mess it up. The weeds couldn't get it. So the potatoes, they'd be fine. The carrots would do, do fine. Anything that's, that's onion, onions, you know, but then you gotta go dig it up. But you gotta be careful when you're digging it up to not damage it. So anyway, the uh, watering <laughs> and the weeding and the waiting, the waiting drives me crazy. So even on this thing, I've had a JPEG of this outreach for about three weeks, but the smart word said, don't start advertising it too early. We don't want people to get tired of hearing about it. The students aren't even back at Purdue yet. They're gonna get this tomorrow. We're hoping they put it on their, their profile picture, we're hoping they put it on their Facebook banners, we're hoping they advertise it all, but more importantly, we hope they have relationships with not yet Christian friends that they can invite because they know them personally and bring them along and ask them what they thought of Dr. Tour's testimony. So that's all part of what's going on here. But anyway, one of the things that's interesting about human beings is they're created male and female, and that's the binary, and that's the part that our culture hates. <laughs> hate the binary, can't have the binary, but guess what? If you hate what God's created, what you love is death, because if you don't have the, the binary, the two, the male, the female, it's, it's not talking about marriage yet, that will come in chapter two, but he created the male and female and said flourish. How are you gonna flourish unless you have both? Well, I watched an old Jurassic Park movie the other day, and evidently blew a dinosaur could reproduce just by himself. And this genetically altered girl could too. And I thought, oh, this is just science fiction if you've ever heard of it. And it's just trying to make us independent of God's design. But we need both to reflect the image of God in the sense of reproduction. It's true that an individual can be created in the image of God without having a significant other of the opposite sex. <clears throat> Obviously, because in Genesis 9 it says, if somebody murders somebody, they forfeit their life because they killed someone who was in the image of God. Not they killed two people that were in the image of God. So you can kill all the men you want to, or you can kill, that, that, that's not what it's about. But for flourishing, to be fruitful and to multiply, it takes the binary, that's God's design. We're gonna see in the next chapter, it involves public commitment, marriage, and that's between two. So anyway, one of the fun things just about Genesis is seeing the beginnings of these things, how they're important, and how the world, the flesh, 
and the devil try to marginalize it, try to put it aside, try to escape it, but it doesn't flourish unless it's in sync with God. Now, am I saying that if you are a Christian and you follow God that you're going to be independently wealthy? By, is that what I mean by flourishing? No, that's not what I mean. But I mean living in harmony and in sync with the God that we worship and love because he first loved us. So we have joy in his presence and whether or not we're martyred for our faith or whether or not we die early because we've got the products of a fall in us and uh, genetic entropy and other things going on matters not. Because as I said earlier in the message, for the Christian to uh, live as Christ and to die is gain. But we want to live our lives under the precepts of the scriptures because they are wholly true in everything that they affirm and they never lie properly interpreted. The devil is quoted in the Bible, and he's a liar, and a murderer, and a thief, and a vandal, and a dehumanizer from the beginning. Um, but God does not lie. He is the author of life, and he wants us to flourish into this new year. So I appreciate your positive testimony from a, a different kind of hard soil. Uh, but our heart soil can receive the word of God tonight and look at some of the glimpses of these new beginnings and chart a course that goes forth to praise, to educate, to edify, to be involved in healing ministry, all exalting Christ as we go. I'm going to close us with a word of prayer. And I don't know if you've heard this or not, but I put it out on our Facebook group that, um, of course, on the last uh, Sunday night of every month, we have our Acts 242 Body Life Spiritual Gifts and Communion Service at our facility that hosts our, our main church. Um, and Sunday nights will be here, except on that Acts 242 meeting. But uh, Kim and I have designed this plan to kind of ramp up the fellowship aspect of the Sunday night meeting. And so we've thought that on the second Sunday of every month, uh, at the end of our meeting, we would have a little bit of a fun fellowship activity. Shouldn't take more than five minutes. And then I think we're going to try to kick out the jams and do some stuff maybe with Heidi if you can hang around. But um, I... After I close this in prayer, I'd like you to hang around for a bit because you're going to get a chance to meet some people that are sitting around you. You might be sitting right next to somebody that you don't know. There may be three people in this room you've not met before, and there'd be opportunity to kind of mix a little bit. But it's nothing that's going to embarrass you, and uh, nothing that's going to uh, be strange. Well, let me pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it is true and transformative. And we do want to be in sync with you. We want to glorify your name. I want you to get all the praise and the glory. Let's do your name. In the strong name of Jesus, we ask it.